Lotto, baby. Let me just break it down one time for the one time, baby. Girl, baby, it's wide open. I'm rolling while I drink. I hope that I can get your number and your name. I'm rolling powers with a bottle of Bombay. And I might let the liquor speak just to see if I finally found the free. Cause I'm rolling while I. And just like that, baby, I couldn't even let the intro go no more. I'm too fucking excited. We are officially live on the official Wado podcast with your boy YDOE. Today's a legendary special episode for me. For anybody watching, today's episode 19 on the Wado podcast features one of my idols, one of my legends growing up, Caden Reinhardt, Cali legend, UNLV, USC, modern day, okay, Marquette, profe- we'll let him do all the talking. But it's somebody that I've always wanted to bring on. Like you guys know, I've changed my shot probably 148 times. Once I found him in high school, everything went, okay, what's Caden doing? I'm switching it there, switching it there. So he's one of the legit influences of my game, of my basketball career, of my shot. And y'all know I'll be shooting that shit. So without further ado, let's go ahead and bring on the legend, Caden Reinhardt. What's up? What's up, bro? How you doing, big dog, man? I appreciate you jumping on the show. Yeah. Appreciate you having me. It's good. It's actually uh, my first podcast, so I'm I'm super excited. I've talked about being on a couple and even starting my own. So now I'm I'm here on the first one, and I'm excited, bro. I'm excited to be a part of it and and uh, you know get to it. Yeah, and I pre- I appreciate you coming on because I was looking. I was like, where's my dog at? No podcast, no interviews yeah. besides just hoop interviews. So I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me reach out to him. And the man responded. He said, let's do it. He's excited. I'm excited. We're blessed. Thank you, Caden. Let's jump right into it, dog. Yeah. So, growing up a Cali kid, what's that like? We moved to Jersey, I believe. Came back. What's the Cali life? It's uh, it's crazy, bro. It's it's it. Every day, pretty much take it for granted. Like, you know, gr- uh, growing up on this side of the coast and then moving to the East Coast, uh, being able to kind of get the best of both worlds and see the differences. You know what I mean? And Nothing like East Coast basketball, I'll tell you that much. It's my favorite. I feel like I got better when I went over to the East Coast just because I learned how to be a, a dog, you know, and, and that was the that was the the part that I missed leaving, you know, the the East Coast coming back here is like I missed the hoops. I missed the shit talking. I missed the, you know, uh, the, the nitty and gritty and getting to the cup, getting fouled and yeah. just all that stuff, you know. And so um, coming back to the West Coast, it's uh it's 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 just different bro you know you're you're summers you're surfing you're going to the beach you're you know doing things that you can still do in the winter time and the fall and spring it doesn't change so it's it's uh you know you take those for granted because you go to the east coast and you have you know those two three months of just straight heat and it's hot and humid and you're like oh i just can't wait for it to cool down and then it's just snowing the rest of the you know time so it's it's a little bit different but uh you know i love the west coast i love it out here i've been here for pretty much my whole life and uh you know went to high school out here went to school out here college out here and you know now i'm back and uh you know from being overseas and actually being able to enjoy the state rather than just hop on a plane and, and going somewhere visit. else and playing or, you know, mm-hmm. visit. And and so now I'm, I'm actually like, wow, I took this for granted, you know, living here on the West coast. Yeah. Now let's talk about high school for a little bit, dog. This is when you were introduced to me, you were on one of the huge yeah. pioneers of ball is life before it was any random kid playing at the, at the gym, his ball is life team mm-hmm. nowadays, but this is when ball is life was on the come up. You were one of the originals, man. What's like high school days coming up young Caden Reinhardt? Man, it was it was such a like I feel like not a lot of people know, you know, everybody sees that whole like junior senior year mix, you know, where I really started to get into uh, you know, who I was as a as an individual. And so my first couple years there, uh, I almost wanted to transfer out of the school because I was like, you know what? I'm not really playing my freshman year, I didn't play a minute on the varsity team. Uh, and this isn't a random behind. school for lady for anyone just yeah. watching doesn't know. This is a yeah. top of the lines academy here, modern day we in had, California. Bro, it's crazy. I get there freshman year, and we have the two weird twins. They went to North Carolina, both Mickey D's. We had Andy Brown, who went to uh, Stanford, was all American, all CIF, all you know, top four star recruit. 
And then we had Tyler Land went to UCLA, played professionally, and then Gary Franklin, who was uh, a big time player, uh, played professionally, went to uh, Cal, and then he went to Baylor. Those were the five people I was behind my freshman year at 15 years old. And I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> this is yeah. this is like, you know, I want to be better than these guys. And I knew I was going to be at that level at a certain point. But getting in there, I was like, wow, this is is this, you know, high school hoops? Is this next level? Is this, you know, and then we started playing, you know, a couple people. At the end of the year, last game of the year, we played Kawhi Leonard and Tony Snell for the championship game. And – I didn't see a minute, bro. I didn't play. Yeah. I mean, maybe like a couple here and there off some blowouts. You know, you get in the game, whatever. So I asked my coach to play JV. I was like, hey, listen, I'm not playing here. I'm killing in practice. It's fun. It's getting me experience. But I want to go hoop. Like, I want to just have fun. Minutes. I want to play. Yeah, I want to just – I want to play. I'm not going to sit here and not play all year. So uh, I remember my first three JV games I played. I had 50-50-50. <laughs> And they were like, yo, you can't play JV anymore. Yeah. You got to you gotta come up and, and play on the varsity team. I was like, no, I'm going to finish the year out. You know, I want to win the league for the JV team and then at least play. Yeah. And so then then the coach started seeing me like, wow, I'm having 50-point games, 60-point games, JV. You know, like as a 15-year-old, 14, 15-year-old, and I'm like, you know what? I'm there. Just give me some time. And then sophomore year happened, and uh, I came back sophomore year, and that was like – propelling me into like where I'm going to be at. And so I had a couple of people we played behind. Keala King was there. Gary Franklin was there. Tyler Lamb was there. Uh, you know, Max Hooper, who now is with uh, the Lakers as a, as a uh, think skills development guy. Um, so my, my sophomore year was kind of like, all right, let's get the ball rolling. And, and how big were you played. going into freshman year? I was only like six, two. I wasn't, okay. that, I wasn't that tall, maybe six, one. Uh, and then I grew that, I grew that summer. I was six, one actually. Cause I grew my sophomore year. I went, to, I got to six, five. Yeah. And then that was, that was it. But I remember my sophomore year, we played Quinn Cook and Victor Oliadipo mm -hmm. on, uh, on, uh, at, uh, the hoop hall on ESPN. Oh yeah. And, uh, I think I, I think I had something like 20, 24, 25. And these were like certified, you know, like these are the guys Real that games. you want to yeah, yeah yeah and so the year before i just remember watching like john wall boogie cousins all these guys on espn i'm like i want to play on espn and kill because that's where i'm going to get some notoriety yeah and that was like my first game and then the next year i had a great aau year you know played really well and then coming into my junior year, i'm like it's over now i'm i'm 17 bigger taller can shoot it can dribble it can confident dunk. i'm like yeah and then that's when i went off against austin rivers and that was like Name after on that, it was like done. <laughs> so that was cool. Austin's still the homie too. He's good people. Yeah, for sure. And you could tell you were always cool with everybody, but you definitely had that dog killer mentality. And so we're up, since we're right on that, what did that come from, dog? Who, who, how'd you get that killer mindset? Cause you always had it. I think it just happened where, to be honest, bro, I don't hope, hope this doesn't come across the wrong way, but when I moved to the East coast and I started hooping when I was, I was young, here like 10 years old I was playing and you know everyone everyone we played against they were good teams we were playing in Orange County or playing you know so I went to I went to the to the east coast and I was the only white person in the gym like that was it and I just remember seeing people just like oh I'm going after this motherfucker oh, I'm going yeah. after this guy I'm going after this guy you know and I'm like nah like I don't want to like I'm yeah it doesn't matter what shit. I look like like I'm yep, gonna give yep. you a bucket period and and I wanted that respect to where, you know, people were like, oh, wow. Like, you know, this guy as a top 10 player in, in his class in high school is like, oh, my God, that's so-and-so. That's so-and-so. Like, he's a dog. He's good. He's good. I wanted that same thing. So I felt like Damn, right. not knowing, you know, not having that notoriety was like, I want to get there. So every game I was killing, I was killing. I, was, I didn't care who I was playing against. I'm like, I'm having 30. It doesn't matter. Right. Guard, that's really all that matters. Yeah, put the best player on me. I'm giving him a bucket every time. I'm going to let him know about it, too. <laughs> As you can see it, I mean, I'm a Florida boy. Grew up here all my life, so I have definitely know what it's like being the only white boy, and that definitely molded me, shaped me. So to hear that when you came across and that kind of gave you that dog, I can believe it, dog. Because like I said, just seeing you shoot, you're always a shooter. People don't know yeah. you're a damn point guard that just kind of became shooters here and there. We'll get there. But you definitely had that give me the ball. Let me get mm -hmm. them. Your moves were a different kind of shake them off of me. It was a mean, a loud score. I'll say that. You were a yeah. loud score, Caden. 
Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it was, it was you know, it, it's like that, that big dude that's just weak, right? Where you walk in the gym like, oh, let's put the ball in the post and let him go at him. Like, when people, you know, would come across and be like, nah, I want him, I'm going at him, or they start talking, it was like, nah. I'm going to talk now and I'm going to give you a bucket. I'm going to let you hear about it. And, and, you know, my, if you're guarding me, you're going to be on a mixtape. That's, that's just, (laughs) that's how I took it in high school. I'm like, you know what? Baller's life was just coming up, which is crazy because we'll uh, later on, I'll I'll get into something with you later. But yeah, that was like the generation, like, like if I was in the baller's life era now. Right. Oh, it would be disgusting because most of the people, they're just making okay plays on a camera. You were making the plays in the biggest games, on the biggest stages, on some great defenders. And it was like, okay, Caden Reinhardt, like, (laughs) well, and 6'4", 6'6", at the time. You know what I mean? And big, uh, 200 pounds. So it's like, that's what I always honed in on. Next level. So let's go ahead. Well, let's not go ahead because you want some rings there, dog. Let's talk about a championship team. What's that like? Mm -hmm. It was crazy. Player of the I just year. remember like, yeah, yeah, CIF player of the year back to back. Uh was uh runner up for Gatorade player of the year and then Aaron Gordon, uh, he ended up getting me on oh. that one his his junior year. It's like they should have just gave it to me, bro. You right, know, why was, not? Uh, I was killing all the senior, <laughs> you know, and they gave it to him. And I think he didn't even win it the next year. I think somebody else won it. Right. Uh, I could believe that. I think he had a, sl- a fall off season, yeah, senior, not as well. But uh I mean he was a great player. I mean, look so at him. Wrong. You know, he's that was who I was going up against. But um, yeah, bro, it's like I wanted to get to modern day. I wanted to win as many state championships as I could and uh, CIF champion, whatever it was. I just wanted to win. And then that year, I think I might have only lost like six games my whole career there. Yeah, yeah, because you had legit had there's a ball of life that follows you through that season, and you see like yeah. one of the two losses, and it's just kind of close losses, then bounce back, bam, 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 we right back. Yeah. Yeah, so that was that was I knew what it I knew what it was like going there just because I knew that um, <clears throat> the program is just it's like a duke, you know. Yeah. You, you know, you come in, you know you're gonna win. Not that you know you're gonna win, but your demand is to go out there and grind it out and go out there and be the best. And we're gonna put the best players on the floor. And so I'm like, you know what? Nobody in California is gonna beat us. So. Yeah, period. Stanley Johnson, you Xavier. I mean, come on, you guys are loaded. Now a lot yeah. of players want the the hype, the limelight, the cameras coming through at the house, but not a lot of people are ready for it. Looking back, do you think it was great for you? Were you ready for it? And did you prosper off having those cameras with you back then and then in the high school days? Yeah, I think, I think it was, I think I, I enjoyed it. I think, uh, might've prepared you. Yeah. I think that, you know, I was in a position to, you know, in, in the high school basketball world, be one of those guys. Damn. Um, you know, I felt like there was there, nobody else was better than me in California, and that's where all ball is life stuff were. So they were like, "Let's do a whole, you know, little web series on you, and you know, start getting you ready for, uh, you know, the ne- the next step." And had I known where social media was or could have been right. then, I would have had it from freshman year on. I would have pumped it more. I would have, you know, tried to do as much. We didn't have the Twitter and Instagram and. Yeah, TikTok and all that stuff that was really buzzing it to get a bunch of views and things like that. But I still think it was part of like my process going there. I feel like it helped, you know, wherever I was at whatever school I was, people would be like, "Oh yeah, I saw you on Ball's Life. Yo, yeah. I used to watch you on Ball's Life." Yeah, even with some of the frat guys and stuff, we'd be in there and like, "Yo, you you were on Ball's Life, bro." Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah. And and legit, that's how I found him. That's how everybody, all of us found him. We're like, who the fuck is this, man? I'm like, I don't know, but I want to shoot just like him. He looks like me. He plays like me. <laughs> I tell you, dog, I can't tell you how many moves I stole. Your little pick man. the ball up and swipe through before you dribble it. Iconic, dog. I stole that. And let me ask you real quick, because I'm a jumper. I try to do things chronological, dog, but it falls. Yeah. No, no, we got people good, like bro. you. I just, you know, I said, fuck. That move right there is iconic to me i have broke people i have shook people i have surprised motherfuckers with that move once you go overseas were they calling carries on that move did you still use it or because yours is perfect without the you know you don't carry it all you don't travel at all but were you still using that move overseas i was because uh overseas you got to put the ball down on the ground before you before you jab and go so like if i was to jab and go dribble that way and step first it was a travel Yep. So this move, when you dropped it on the ground, it it, it allowed That's me to get dribble. away with it. And I was like, oh, this is 
I'm going at everyone with this from right. left side, right side, top of the key. Uh, and it worked, it worked in my favor. There's a couple of things were a little bit different, but you know, just putting the ball on the ground first was the, the biggest adjustment that I had to make. Yeah. Cause I had to ask you about that. Cause I see a lot of guys, I got friends that played overseas. You see them all the time and they get five travels in a row because they're not putting that ball down, but yours is legit yeah. a crossover, just a standing cross. You put that ball down and it's, <laughs> Come here. What do That's you do? A, it's a jab with a cross and it's mean too. <laughs> Fucking mean, dog. Now, you're someone that I emulated my shot after. I told you I, I changed my shot 30, 138 times, bro, from here to there that, to cool. that to this. When I found you, I was like, oh, got it. Who inspired you? Did you try to uh, emulate your shot after anybody? So I like when I was really young, maybe like 10 or 11, this, this AAU coach would, would, uh, would uh work with us like after practices or whatever and i just remember one thing he would always say was just like leave it out there like like you're asking a girl to marry you pretty much like leave like hold that ring out there um and that kind of stuck with me like being able to flick my wrist and 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 you know have it stay there and so then when i got a little bit older i think after my freshman year of high school i changed my shot uh, I was shooting a little bit sideways, like, right, right. like trying to get it off. Uh, I think I just wasn't strong enough. And then um, uh, what's his name, bro? Tim, is it Gruden? Uh, some, some shooting coach that came to the gym, NBA guy, NBA shooting, the guy, uh, Tim Glover, the one that used okay. to work with Kobe. Okay. Yep. Yep. Uh, he was at the gym one time and he was like, Hey, if you get your shot a little bit to the right of your nose, you'll be able to fire it off quicker. And I was like, really? And he was like, yeah, just put it right here and do the same shot and just get it, get it up quicker. And so I worked on that for like three or four weeks. And I was like, yo, I can get my shot off way faster. I can get it off the dribble. You know, I can pump fake it easier. Yep. And after that, I was like, you know, I was just shooting. We're locked. We're locked yeah. in. Cause legit the way I looked at it, you know, as far as I can remember the white boy, cash shooter that didn't play like a white boy was the jj reddick and we had a little jimmer yeah. and it was caden fucking reinhardt for me dog i was like yo look at this boy pulling that bitch left right off the dribble pump fake it didn't matter and now when did you transition from point guard to let's shoot or were you always a point guard that the team forced you to change it was the team bro my yeah. my pops always gets gets uh not mad but he just gets a little like hey you know, you didn't want to play point guard, you know, gets on me a little bit. You didn't want to right. play point guard. Oh, lost him there for a little bit. Easy. Might even had a phone call. Got you, got you back. You're good, buddy. Oh, maybe not. Sometimes when the service, when they get phone calls. Oh, there you go. Oh, there we go. My bad. You good, big dog. Um, yeah. Uh, point guard was just something that was I, – I loved it. I loved being able to pass the ball more than I like to shoot it, really. But yep. everybody wanted me to play, you know, the shooting guard spot just because I can get a bucket. I could shoot really, really well. I could handle it. I was like another little point guard on the floor. And I wanted to be a 6'5 PG, you know, who could pass the ball, could shoot it. And, you know, kind of just because I was in that, you know, one, two, and three, like, hybrid – Right. They wanted me to be, you know, the two. And then I started moving to the three because I could play different positions. And it was Defend. kind of just like, yeah, yeah it was, I can guard a guy that's, you know, six, eight, but then mm -hmm. I could also guard a guy that's six feet. Um, so that kind of, that kind of threw a little mix in there and they just wanted me to play two. And then I was kind of back and forth between combo. Um, you know, I had I known I would have went back and been PG. The whole time, right? And you were kind of sure. early with the tall, big point guard days. That was kind of they were still thinking, "Hey, the shorter guy, he's a shooter. Let's make him run around all the time." Yeah, wide and couple the here floor. and there. Yeah, a couple here and there, and you're like, "Yo, this like Kyle Anderson was my Kyle guy. Anderson, he's right? Six eight came. PG, and that was like rare. Everybody knew he wasn't going to play the PG spot, you know, mm -hmm. post high school. But he got to play PG his whole four years in high school, and as a as a he was listed as a PG. Right. So and I that, and I, I mean, never was a fan of people putting shooters that can play point guard just to be the shooter. Because yeah, he spaces the floor, but if it's Kaden Reinhardt is a point guard and a fucking knockdown shooter, his own point guard play spaces himself and them. You know, now it's a well, then, now 
what are you going to do on him? You have to put your point guard on him to, to defend him. Yeah. Mismatch. Well, then it goes back to that's why – I mean, this is where I feel like I should have been a point guard because every game you go see in college that I played at the point guard's position, you know, high percentages in three points, over yep. 15 points, you know, over five assists. Uh, over four rebounds. So I, you know, those, those are good numbers at that spot. You go to the, when I was at Marquette in the, uh, the big East, we played three back-to-back game or three back-to-back to back games. And I was playing the PG spot. One of them, I think we played oh, Georgetown. I forget. I know the back-to-back we beat Nova mm-hmm. at Marquette, Josh Hart, who is a defender, right. the, is in the NBA. Like, ah, I don't know. A Kagan guy gave him buckets. Yeah, buckets that uh, day. Then uh, DiVincenzo, who's who's a guy that's in the league, Bucks. Yeah, you know, at the at the PG spot. Then I went mm-hmm. the next game. We played Creighton, and my yes. my coach put me back at PG because I was like, "Yo, I'm like this is where I got to play." First half, seventeen points, five assists, four rebounds in the first half. First half, I'm like it's different, you know, because I I have the ability to score whenever I want to score, and then I can pass the crap out of the ball like i mean even all my coaches overseas are like damn i didn't really know you could pass the ball like that i'm like yeah i just don't play you know a position where i'm coming off ball screens all the time able to make reads i'm only you know getting an iso bucket or i'm coming off a pick and roll and i can attack you know the big and go downhill yeah so it was different i wish i would have played more pg because sure. I see a lot of comments saying, man, I wish he would have stayed at point guard. Man, and see, I have the point guard. He was the fucking man. And I just have always been a fan of that, too. Like, yo, he needs the ball more. Shooters don't yeah. – and le- some shooters are legit. Just give them and let them shoot open. That's all they're going to do. Maybe a, a block here and there. Yeah. But guys like Kay, then, that when they get the ball in their hand, their shooting percentage goes up. That fire yeah. comes – you know what I mean? It's just like let them get hot. Let them take it to the rack a few times. Free throws. You're a great free throw shooter, bro. Like – Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. And now you are yeah. one of two players in NCAA history to ever have made it to the NCAA tournament on three separate teams, and that's saying a lot to me. So let's go ahead and take a stop at UNLV. That's where you committed to in high school. Why'd you commit? Did you like it? What's your short time at UNLV like? Yeah, I loved. I loved it there. It was between there and Texas, and the, at the time, uh, I was right after the KD camp. Me and uh, I mean. KD had really, really wanted me to go to Texas. He's a big advocate of Texas. He, yeah. Like, you know, Texas is the greatest school of all time. And, you know, giving me all the, the spiel on, on why I should go to UT. And uh, <clears throat> at that point, I was like, you know what? I could be in my backyard. And it's a four-hour drive to, to UNLV. Um, you know, uh, at the time, Anthony Bennett was not committed there. But I was super close with with uh, him throughout the sports world. So I was like, yo, we can, we could really do something special here. We could bring back yeah. the rebels. We can, you know, so before I committed, I'm like, bro, if I'm committing, you're committing. It is what it is. Like we're going to make this thing, we're going to make it rock. And so that's what kind of propelled that whole situation where I'm like, I want to play with AB. AB's great. We had a guy coming back that next year that just won uh, Mike Mosier, who's now uh, a coach. Uh, who's he coaching for? Some NBA team now. Um, he, he came back and he was like the leading, uh, triple double, uh, leading rebounder in, in college. And so, uh, he was returning and we had a couple just really good guys. Bryce Dazon Jones, who transferred from USC actually passed away yeah. five years ago. I want to say now, um, played for the Pelicans. Um, so we had a, we had a squad and I'm like, this is it. So went there and, uh, you know, preseason top 10 did really well throughout the year and just had some injuries kind of, you know, not really help us and people weren't healthy. And then by the time we got back to rolling, we had uh, Alan Crabb and Cal in the first round of the tournament. Alan Crabb ate us a lot. Oh, man. He went crazy. But you still made yeah. it, though, and that was big time to me that you even made. That was Mohawk Kate and Reinhardt days, right? Yeah, that was no tats and just <laughs> – No tats, just slinging know, I that was shit. Like, I'm in Vegas, bro. I, people were like – what are you what are you doing i'm like i'm in vegas like it's a show this is what i this is like this is why i like to i want to come out here and entertain twenty thousand people like i know it's college but like this is i want to do this next level i want to be a pro yeah when i'm a pro you know people have you have birdman you have guys like 
you know, wearing whatever they want to wear to have a, oh, a, yeah. a sense where people are like, oh, yeah, I want to, you know, kids want to wear that stuff. So I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm in Vegas. I'm just going to do a couple of designs in my hair and wear a mohawk, see how it rocks. And then, well, first page of ESPN the next day. Caught like, fire. Is, yeah, I'm like, this is crazy. This is Caught crazy. fire. And now, so a lot of people hated on uh, Anthony Bennett getting that number one draft pick. for, But for, as his teammate, can you speak on how great he was at UNLV? Bro, I've never seen anyone with more talent at any school I've been to than this kid, bro. That's saying a lot. I'm telling you, it was the cra- – like, homie would just walk in the gym and be a, a monster. Literally. Dribble, pass, shoot, dunk, everything, bro. Everything. And then when you saw it live – Right. You were just like, dude, you got a 40 inch vert at 6'8 with a 7'2 wingspan. And you're just dunking Slamming. everything. Yeah, you can get by people. I was, I, I still to this day have not seen a college player with as much talent as him. Yeah, that for size, sure. that, you know, what are you going to do with him? He's ferocious. He was fast shooting threes. I mean, it was scary. You to put see a that. three on him, he's going straight at you in the post. You put a four or five on him, he's way too fast for you. Like, it was just a mismatch. And we played him at the five sometimes, bro. Right. We put him at the five because we're, like, pick and roll, have him catch the ball on the top, and ISO, go straight at the five. man. And yeah. that's kind of – that was, like, the small ball, sh- you know, that was going on that, that yep, nobody yep, yep. was really playing. But he was – yeah, he was really good, bro. He was really good. And then, you know, I, I, I think that just a lot of the hype and a lot of the, the things – not got to him, but a lot of the negative things that people say about, you know, you being a bust and not being this and yeah. your homie's the number one pick in the NBA draft. I don't think he's I mean he, can't be a cool, bust he, in anyone's life. Yeah, he's the number one pick in the NBA draft. How many people are gonna say that? Nope, I didn't even get drafted. Right. You know? man. So it's uh, hard to even make it. And and most of the guys, to be honest, you see like the NBA is filled with like guys you didn't really hear about and then they make their way. So the NBA yeah. is literally you get there, get humbled, it's up to you make it or break it. And sometimes it's just too much pressure on him. I feel like, you know, number one pick young kid, but I just had to ask you because a lot of people didn't even realize why he deserved that pick. But if you go back and look, he was a Bro. fucking freight train, especially that year. Yes. Who was, be- who was better than him that year? Uh, in college. Was, like you can was... go look at the draft class and see who was drafted and stuff and be like, Oh yeah, yeah. This person should have went, but that's five years down the line, six years. Right. Down the line right. Looking they... down. Yeah. This, no, this dude was, a monster, and you got to think people are tired of the oh we, he's a number one then he's a bust so people are almost trying the he might, he's a smaller school UNLV he's not at Duke not at you know North Carolina but what he was doing was groundbreaking and yeah, now after he was UNLV doing his all go ahead. Too. <laughs> oh bro balling yeah. it didn't make sense and dunking like fucking Shaq breaking that shit and it was just like okay Crazy, I get it bro. so after UNLV we take a trip to USC <clears throat> what's that like big dog why to move there and how'd you like it. Yeah, SC was uh, SC was really cool. I've I've grown up a, a USC fan, so you know uncles and family. Five because of Reggie Bush now. Yeah, oh, yep. okay. that was my, that was my favorite number, bro. Growing up, so I'm like, you know what? You having a chance. I was committed to USC before I uh, I was verbally committed my junior year of high school to uh, USC, um, and then I ended up decommitting because the, the coach there left, and yep. it just wasn't really what I wanted to do. And then coming back, uh, you're going to like this. So it was, it was USC and Florida Gators and Billy Donovan was there and Billy wanted me to go there for a long time, like had a high school. So he's like, come on, come on, come on, come on. Like, look what we did with Bradley Beal. Look at like all these things. And I'm like, ah, I want to Casey Hill was going there, which I was cool with. Um, uh, big old tall Chris. Chris was there. Yeah, yeah. Chris uh, Walker. Yeah, Chris Walker. Um, so I really wanted to go there. I I did, and then my my assistant coach Tony Bland uh, at USC, I had known since I was a little kid, and so he was like, "Bro, come home. We're building the you know this crazy, you know USC is going to be back on the map." Which now USC is a, a you know a school to look out for. Okay. They've been the Sweet Sixteen the last three years in a row. Yep. You know, so that was like, it was very hard to say, how do I, you know, from, from having an assistant coach that would be on my side that I've known for a long time to go to a school I've always wanted to go to, yep. to get a degree from USC, 
you know, those, those things were playing in my head and I was in the PAC 12. I mean, Arizona, great school. They were, yep. you know, powerhouse. You had Oregon, you had Utah with DeLon, uh, DeLon Wright. There was, there was a lot of people that were really right. good in that league. And I was like, Kyle Kuzma was there. Yep. Yep. Uh, was in Utah. So it, it was, it was kind of like, what do I do? What do I, you know, and then I'm like, I want to be home. I want to come back home and play in front of my hometown and, you know, go to a school I've always wanted to go to just made that decision and, you know, ended up, ended up staying there. Loved your time there too. You were hooping. I was like, anytime I seen him, I was like, okay, USC, a couple more games I get to see on TV. Now my dog playing. And now yeah. the final stop, the grass season at Marquette. This is when you really kind of tore it up for real dog. What was it like at Marquette for you? Alumni, the old great Dwayne way back there. Shout yeah. out. It was a, uh, it was, it was a crazy decision, bro. Cause I was either going to stay uh, at USC uh, I got offered a couple contracts to go play in Turkey uh, and leave one year early. And I was kind of like, I don't want to go overseas yet, you know, because that post-basketball, not that it was always going to be there, but God willing, I didn't get hurt and I played successfully right. throughout the year. Overseas will be there. And uh, another story that happened in Marquette, the assistant coach, Stan Johnson, who's a coach at LMU right now, uh, he gave me my first offer at Utah when I was 14 years old, he gave me my first ever college offer. Small world. And so very small world. And so it was kind of almost like, wow, like we always were in like somewhat communication as much as we could throughout those live periods and things like that. But like, he was somebody that I would always talk to whether it was going to the school or not. He was just a great dude. And so I was like, how do I say no to going to, you know, a big E school and, you know, going to, a place like Marquette with all that history and, you know, it's another historic school after, you know, UNLV and USC. And there's a couple different schools that I was thinking about going to VCU was one of them, Georgetown, yep. Providence, a bunch of schools in the big East were recruiting me. And at the time I was like, I want to go to Marquette. There was nobody else that was there. They didn't have any two guards. And then we were supposed to sign another big that ended up not being eligible and so that kind of, you know, spun some things with me with having to play the four over there and, yeah. you know, having to play a position. I was out of position, which was, you know, not what I wanted to do, but I was there and I made the most of it. And then it just became almost like a mismatch. And oh, yes, it was. You know, you had fours guarding me. And they Anytime just, you got to the top of the key, it was, huh, huh, huh. <laughs> yeah, it came guard me as a four. <laughs> but it was, it was different, though. It was, it was a, you know, I, I feel like in each different spot, I learned so many things throughout, you know, my career in basketball. And I think it just helped in any way overseas when I had to, you know, be put out on the floor to play a position. I damn near played all five. Period. And I think it's good to ask because a lot of players need to know this and need to figure this out, especially when you get to the higher levels. Caden, how did you – how were you able to find your role in so many different spots knowing you had to sacrifice what you truly wanted to do and still succeed in that role that you found? Yeah, I just – I have this weird competitive – not weird, but, you know, I'm very, very competitive. So it doesn't matter, you know, I'm playing beer pong to sports to golf to whatever it is, bro. Like, I just want to be the best at whatever I'm doing. And yep. so if somebody puts me in a position is like, look, this is this is the minutes you're going to get. This is what – you know, this is where we have to play you at because of X, Y, and Z. I wanted to be the best four on the floor, period. So you can't say anything about it, you know, yeah. like, okay, put me at the two, then I'm the best two guard in practice. I'm the best point guard in practice. And so I took that challenge on to say, you know what, I'm here for a year. I got to play this position. You know, I, at a certain time I can slide over when bigger guys get in the game, like Sam Hauser, for instance, who was there who now plays for the Celtics. When he mm -hmm. got in the game, I could play the two and the three and the, right. and the one and it helped. So I was like, I'm not going to not just, you know, be mad and sulk and be like, Oh, I gotta, you know, I had to make it work. And so after that, I'm like, I'm going to be the best player on the floor. That's yeah. it. I don't care if I'm, you know, six foot five, four today. Like just, it is what it is. And you doing that helped the team in the long run, in the big picture. And a lot of guys, I think, just get too weak and they're too weak minded and when they're not in doing their role, what they did in high school, uh, this mm -hmm. is not me. And you have to be able to find your role, create a new one. And as long as the team's winning, 
you should be happy. It should be the, the whole goal. So I really yeah, want to ask that. The, dog. You get to the next level though. Like if, if I were, if, if like, let's say you're saying that as an athlete, right? You're, mm-hmm. you're being like, Hey, you know, this is what I, this is not my position. I'm not this and that. All right. So somebody pays you $20 million next year and tells you to sit your ass on the bench and play the four. What are you going to say? I'm on. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah, sir. Exactly. Exactly. Like there's, you know, you get to the next level, you might have to play out of position. You might be a point guard that has to play the two. You might have to, cause they got Russell Westbrook playing the one. Yeah. You might have to be a, a, a three instead of a two. Cause they got, you know, uh, uh, Donovan Mitchell playing it too. like there's there's so many scenarios that go out on the on the, the the floor that you can't really predict but if you're able to adapt and be the best at what you're what you're able to do and be playing at that level at a high level then the coaches and the players are going to be like all right like this dude is you know he gets out on the floor he plays his ass off he plays you know he plays good team ball he you know if he shoots a couple bad shots it is what it is homie's out there doing his thing you know, yep. so that's how I, I looked at it, too, because I knew I was going to shoot a couple a yeah, couple shots where people were like, yo, what the like, what is that? But I, to me, that's a that's a bucket. It's not. Yeah. You can't do what I can do. So, of exactly. course, you're going to say, like, what the hell was that? And but, now yeah. I, I was a shooter as well. And sometimes especially early on, I got real good after college and shit. But high school days, confident eh, wasn't that I knew I could shoot, but I wanted to make the right play. And a lot of my teammates and coaches would be like, yo, Wyatt shoot the ball we believe in you green light did you have that a lot Kaden reinhardt and everyone knows you're a big shooter but once you get to those like you said might have a couple bad ones did you have teammates and coaches that let you know reassured you you're Kaden reinhardt shoot the fucking ball yeah i i for sure had at every school i was at every every you know every coach knew that if i got into a slump they'd be like we don't care if you shoot 10 of them in a row and you miss all 10 of them like you're gonna get at, at when you're out on the floor, you're the best shooter, scorer, you know, whatever at that position. Like we trust in you to to do that. So I remember I had a couple of bad games. You know, I've had a couple of bad games here and there, and just I expressed it more in practice. Mm-hmm. Where if I wasn't getting things going and I wasn't able, to, I was just pissed. I was just like mad at myself because I spent so much time in the gym. Like, how? Why is the ball not going in the hoop? Like. But I always have people just, you know, this is what you do. Keep shooting, keep shooting. We're rocking with it. We're rocking with it. And that helps for sure, you know, your yeah. mental. Because now you're not like, okay, like, you know, homie over here is mad at me for shooting exactly. five shots and I'm missing. And now I got to worry about him. And But then again, it goes back to the dog mentality. I don't – you're not – you can't shoot better than me. So I'll take ten shots over your yep. ten shots any day. Yep, I think it's important to have the teammates, the coaches reassure you, but it starts with the dog mentality, number one. They can't make yep. you make the shot just from the sideline. You got to have that first. Yeah. Now, that's big. Now, now, Caden, after Mar- – or we'll stay on Marquette because you had some big wins there, man. The Villanova yeah. win I've watched probably three, four times in a row. What was that like? Take us through pregame. Did you know it was going to be a big game, and what was it like getting that dub? I just got the chills talking about it right now, bro. Come on, man. I've watched it literally crazy. three times yeah. today. It was it was like number you know, one like, Villanova. Yeah, you 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 just think about times like this in college basketball. You think about like you know, obviously you want to be the number one team in winning a championship, but let's say you're not, right? And you got all this, you know, this is the number one team in the country. Again, dog mentality. You come in here and you're the number one team in the country, I want you, 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 and you. Like they wrote you off already. Yeah, like this is this is, you know, they had they won the national championship last year. They were number one. And I had them. I mean, that was part of the reason why I wanted to go to the Big East. I wanted to play against Jay Wright and Villanova. That was yeah. it. I was like, they won the national championship. I want to play against these guys. Yep. And uh, that game, bro, was crazy. We, we, we were playing really well throughout the year. We're kind of like, you know, hitting a stride and had a great, great practice that week. And everybody thought we were going to get beat. You know, everyone's like, oh, this is, you know, another win for Villanova and yada, yada. And we're like, all right, let's 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 go do it. So game day rolls around. I feel great in warm-ups. Like, I feel fantastic. And Was the whole team confident going in? <laughs> everyone was confident. You know, you're at home yeah. and you got the number one team in, in, the, in the house. It's like, you know, we either lose or we win and celebrate. Like, yeah. let's just go out and put it all out there. And so – the first half, bro, we just couldn't hit a shot. I just remember, like, 
everything. I mean, I missed a layup. I missed a free throw. I don't ever miss free throws. Nope. Uh, you know, our, our shooter, Marcus Howard, was in foul trouble. Uh, Drew Rousey was was not really hitting. He was, he's a shooter. Uh, Sam Hauser. Like, we had guys just weren't hitting. We were just getting beat because we were just not making good sh- – uh, not making shots. And second half rolls around, and I think we're down, like, 15 at the second half. And I just remember in the locker room, like, yo, we got – we're down 15. We got one half left. Let's put it together right now and make it a, you know, a 10-point game at 10 minutes. Let's just get it to 10 within 10 minutes. That's all we care about. Let's not, you know, try to run it back and make spectacular shots and be like, ah, you know, get all excited. Let's put it to 10 with 10 minutes and get get going. And so I just remember the first couple – the couple minutes of the second half is bang, bang, bang. Call the timeout. Got to stop. Dunk. Call yep. a timeout, and we have momentum, and I'm like, yeah, it's done. We're coming back for sure. And I just remember it was like back and forth, back and forth, and we couldn't break it, and the last five minutes of the game just turned on. Turned it up. Shots, shots, big three, a big two. And, I mean, what was the celebration like for the whole team on that one? Because, I mean, no one expected you guys to do it like that, dog. Yeah, we were I'm watching we were, the highlights of it right now. Yeah, I remember coming into the huddle. If you can remember that uh, that play where I jabbed Divincenzo and came mm-hmm. off the ball screen and shot it. Yep. Divincenzo was talking talking mad shit, bro. Going into the one of the timeouts at the last second half, he was like, "Going, we were going at it. Him and I were jawing with each other, and he's like, I got you the rest of the game, bro. You're not scoring another bucket.' I'm like, okay, you put Mikael Bridges. He's he he's you know already a defender." Gave yep. him buggy. Put Josh Hart on me. I already give him six or seven points. Yep. What do you want, bro? <laughs> like, what Sounds you, good. It's, it come, come get this. So uh, I just remember towards that end of the game, under six minutes, I told my coach, I'm like, listen, put the ball in my hands the rest of the game. Yep. We're going to, we're going to, I'm going to go win the game. And I looked him in the eye and told him that. And then Wojo was like, all right, go ahead, make the plays. And that's when I was playing PG. And, he was like, go ahead, make the plays, make the right plays. We're trusting you to put the ball in your hands. And I remember after that, our confidence was over, bro. I'm like, I got 20,000 people in here, you know, it waiting for us. It looked like an ocean out there. It was, it was just, and then I had DiVincenzo on me and I was like, yeah, he, he's going to, he can. Even more free kill for you just to kind of go <laughs> yeah. at him. And that last step back three you hit with a minute to go, it's just like, okay. Yeah, Huge game, was, bro. That was probably, I just remember making that shot, bro. And the whole crowd was nuts. Yeah, they called a timeout. They called a timeout and went nuts. And I just remember after that, it was crazy. It was crazy. Oh, man. Congrats on that win, bro. Like I said, I've watched it probably three times today just looking back like, man, what a win. What a victory. Now, after, after college, we go pro overseas. What's professional basketball like for you? Yeah, that was, that was a, uh, 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 you know, an eye opener for sure because you know coming from modern day to UNLV to USC to, to all these different schools and you know you get Nike gear and you get every you get everything you you know you get everything you need and uh, it's all high level like ice baths and this and that and so when I went to uh, my first year uh, started out it was either go to the G League or start my European career. And I always wanted to do G League or, or D League, whatever it was at that time before it mm-hmm. switched. But I didn't want to make the money that guys were making in the G League. And so I was like, I'm going to go somewhere overseas that I can have the opportunity to make more money and then come back by playing right. in a good league. So my agent was like, hey, we're going to take, you know, this position in Lithuania. And I was like, Lithuania? I didn't even know – I didn't even know where Lithuania was. You know, I was like, <laughs> where, like, what do you mean? So, right. Uh, he's like, we're going to go here, and this is the plan we're going to put in place. And I was like, listen, I'm not staying there for more than two months. I give myself 60 days, and I'm going to hoop, and you got to get me out of there. Yep. And he's like, all right, go ahead, do it. And I'm like, no, I'm dead. I'm telling you right now, like, I'm going over there. I'm not staying in this league. I'm not making this money. I'm going over there, and I have 60 days to do what I need to do. And then I'm out. You got to get me out. Go somewhere else. Get a team to buy me out. And he's like, all right, as long as you do your part, I'll do my part. So I went over there, bro, and Lithuania was just different, dude. I'm yeah. trying to, like, 
Like you go there and it's like low, like the team I was at was, was on the bottom of the league. Mm -hmm. Uh, You had big teams there. You had two big teams that paid mad money that are, that I was like, okay, if I go to Lithuania, I'll go play there because I'm making half a million to a million dollars playing for these teams. So it was just a grind every day where I went there. Nobody spoke English. Um, You know, uh, my wife is half black. So when she was over there, people were like, right wow you know Still I'm like, a this little is, older this times 20, over there this huh? is 2020 like this is not you know like it's just they don't they just don't see unless you play sports it's like why are other people over here than just you know russians and lithuanians yeah. and so um you know i get into the locker room i remember and they gave me one practice jersey and said we got to do our laundry and i was like what what is this you know i'm not i'm, I'm never I'm, i've never like i i did but like not you know, college and all that. Was, right, right. Yeah. So I just remember going there like, you know what? I got 60 days to lock in. I spent yeah. all my time in the gym. I didn't care what was going on. I was going to get better. I was going to get better. I was going to get better. And, you know, I got the I got the opportunity to get the ball in my hands the whole game. Right. And after that, I was like, you know, I'm going to I'm going to go to work. I'm going to play you know, this Euro League team, this Euro League team. And I was like, every time I play a Euro League team, I need to have 20 points. I need to. I need to have a yeah. dub. And uh, it worked out that way for sure. I got there. Yeah, because the over there, literally the every year. game is like a, a recruitment, right? No matter if you're on the yeah. other team, they're always looking at you, especially the Americans. Always. So I went there and I remember playing Kevin Pangos and, and uh, Zalgiris. And uh, I was like uh, – this one dude is Troy Troy Copain or something like that. He played in the NBA for like a year, two years. Um, and uh, he was guarding me. And I'm like, dude, I got a league guy here that's guarding me and a EuroLeague team. I'm going off. I'm going crazy. <laughs> and then that first game was crazy. I think I had 25 the first game. And then after that, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I got to compete every game because I'm trying to get out of here. I don't want to be here unless I'm making big money. And so yeah. I was there for 65 days, five days more than I wanted to be. I got bought out. I went to Bosnia. Um, that was a, a team that uh, was was in a in a good division with like Red Star, Partizan, mm-hmm. uh, all the all those teams in there that you know uh, are all the like that league was a really good league. So I went to a team that was somewhat decent in there, and you know I could have the same opportunity. And so I went there, and uh, I told my agent, I'm, I literally get there, bro. There's this one street light that goes front back left right in the whole city <laughs> and i'm just i'm in a village i'm like this is nuts bro this is what hooping is going to be like like i have to get a bag to play over here because i can't right. there's no way i'm going to be living like this making certain i just can't do it mm-hmm. it's not you know nobody speak i had a translator follow me everywhere i had people telling me what to do in the games that was weird so i told my agent i said same thing i need to get out of here you got i gotta hoop and i gotta play against all the best teams and you gotta get me out Mm-hmm. and I was there for four weeks, got bought out from a German team, and then I ended up playing in Germany for two years. For was Germany a lot team. better? Germany was great, bro. Okay, I love Germany. Yeah, I loved it. Germany was great. Uh, the people there are great, more Americanized. Uh, so, you know, you can, get a, you can get around and, you know, not feel like you're like – the odd one like, out. Yeah, like life. what's going on? People are more friendly. And then my last name's German. My great grandfather's from Germany. So uh, I tried to get my passport while I was playing there to be a dual citizen, which would have been cool. But it was good. Germany was great. I loved the city I was in. And uh, and then, yeah, bro, my second year, I, re- I, I got re signed late because I was going to go opt out and be a free agent, which, you know, if I were to re- go back and do it, I probably should have done that. But uh, re-signed with this team. We had a great squad and playing really well. And then uh, I ended up having a stress fracture in my foot mid-season that I had to sit out for two months. And it was kind of just like, you know, one of those things where I was just, you know, mad, frustrated. Yeah. You know, getting hurt during that. It's not, you know, you don't want to do that. So um, ended up coming back, having a good year playing the last like four or five games. I think I averaged 20 in the last five games, which was crazy. And then, uh, yeah. And then uh, went to Belgium for a year, half a year and brought the team, you know, the first place, the first time they were in first place in eight years, we, you know, 
were I think we lost one game that year. We were supposed to win the championship, playing really well. So it was kind of like nobody was really resigning me because they thought I was injured. They thought my foot wasn't this. And then I ended up having a great year and then COVID hit, bro. And yeah, shut it down. Just, you know, we we got sent home. <clears throat> and then after that, it was kind of like, you know, where do I go next? What do I do? I was going to play in the G League uh, with the Lakers in the bubble. Mm-hmm. And last, 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 last minute, like I'm talking about three – I'm talking to the, the G League reps. I'm talking to the G League commission. I'm talking to all these people. And all of a sudden, the Lakers pull out. And that was the only team that I was going to play with that my agent put time and effort into that I would get minutes and I would, you know, be a guy that could produce and not just sit on the bench. Gotcha. Then it just kind of left me like, where do I go? You know, what do I do next? Where do I go? I got a couple offers in Ukraine, which we all know where Ukraine's at right now. And Right, right. That was um, that one. Is Israel was another one. Israel's kind of like a bunch of my buddies that have played over there were like, yeah, it's cool and all, but it's also, you know, they have bomb threats every week. Mm-hmm. Like just, so I was like, you know, if I'm getting paid enough money, it's one thing. If I'm not, you know, I got to go play in the G league or I got to try to figure something out. And so uh, that's that rest of the year during COVID that lasts like two months, three months. I didn't play for a team. You know, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't do anything. I was working out going into the next season. uh, I was going to play in the G league. And then it kind of just got to the point where, you know, it just, it wasn't making sense for me. And I was like, dude, where do I go from here? Like, what do I do? I I don't want to go sacrifice another year again, you know, in Europe and make to me, you know, I'm not, I wasn't being, I wasn't being selfish or anything or like people die to be in that position that I was in. And I absolutely loved it. But next step where I was at in my life was like, I want a family, mm-hmm. you know, I want to be able to support them. I want to be able to take care of them. And, you know, getting older, it's like, where, you know, what's more important is, you know, continuing to grind out and make the league more important than starting a career and being successful at a young age and then being able to take care of my family and, you know, make the money I want to make. And yep. it was tough, bro. I didn't, I didn't, I mean, I haven't even told anybody or put anything out there that I've officially been done, you know, things like that. Cause I, I, I didn't want to at all. I was yeah. just like, ah, I don't know. So then it Google still got point. you as a pro basketball player current. They still don't even know the Wikipedia. Yeah. 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 So it was just, you know, I was like, where do I go from here? And I just kind of was like, I'm going to go make money right now. And real estate is something that I wanted to do post basketball, just, you know, having the money to do developments and things like that. And so I was like, let me jump into real estate. And at the time, real estate was hot the last, you know, a year and a half ago. Oh, yeah. It was just booming. So I'm like, okay, let me just get in here. I know a lot of people I can, you know, connect with. And that's what, you know, started that and just became super successful in my first year you know, and and not a lot of people do, you know, what I got to do in my first year. And so it just kind of propelled, you know, me to be doing this instead of hooping. And it's different though, bro. Yeah. And now before we even, because I'm going to dive in on real estate a little bit, you did play in the Drew League. You you still make appearances over there, here and there? Because I love seeing you over there, dog. What's that like? Yeah. So I'll tell you. So when I stopped playing basketball, I didn't touch a basketball for two years, bro. Wow. I didn't wow. touch a ball. Like I'm talking you about. You had to I step away or just you're busy? I I did. I, I just, I've been doing it since I was seven, eight years old playing ball. And I was just like, maybe it's just, maybe it's just, you know, a mental thing. Maybe I just got to step away for a little bit and then come back to it. And I think what it did was just, I didn't want to be involved with it because I knew I would want to play. Yeah. And right. I didn't want to go down that route again because mentally it was just like, I'm not going to go play and make that type of money. Mm -hmm. It wasn't bad money, but it was just, I can't, you know, be gone this long and then try to have a family and support them on that. So, uh, you know, that's where it kind of was just like, let's make a decision. You know, my pops was like, just play in the G league and do real estate. And, you know, just, you know, my wife, even to this day, bro, is like, you need to, you need to play basketball. And she'll tell me every day, like, why aren't you hooping? Why aren't you You're too good? Like you see, she sees Tyler Harrow on TV. Like, nah, like, <laughs> <laughs> right. if you got that opportunity, like a Tyler Harrow, you'd be doing what he does times 10. 
Yes. You know, and he's Lakers could have used you last year, dog. They only needed a yeah, fucking shooter. So Spread the floor. That, it just, yeah. So it was one of those things where I had to make a decision and, you know, move forward. And uh, tough though, bro. I didn't, I didn't, you know, touch a basketball. It didn't, didn't work out. You know, I was just kind of like over it. I'm like, I'm going to take a break. And after that, I started, uh, you know, wanting to get back to hoop, I had to itch again, and I started playing in a couple of men's leagues just to just to hoop. <laughs> Crazy! It, that's put not up even astronomical numbers. They don't even let let loose the oh, public no. over there, dog. <laughs> they, were, they were. I remember the first game I had fifty eight, the first one, sixty two, the second one, I think fifty one, yep. the first, the third one. I was like, this is crazy. I didn't even touch the ball in two years. And then the so, love just comes back for it. And then you start working out again, J-Law, Bar. I see a lot of clips on there. So you really start yeah. to get back into it just to sharpen the skills or what? I don't know, bro. You know? I've done, you never I've, know? I, I, I miss it. I want, you know, I want to do it. I've been working out lately, just kind of just, you know, easing my way back in. But, I mean, I it's hard to say no, you know. I, yeah. I definitely would want to try to you know, start working out and just getting back in shape and seeing what happens after that. If the Lakers gave you a call and said, in a month, we need you, I think you're ready. Yeah, I say I so. think you'll be certified, sure. ready to go for that. Yeah. Now, it's, now it's aside it's from basketball, yeah. I mean, literally this year, I'm just like, you know what? What? Why, where's, where the fuck is Caden Reinhardt at? Where's Caden Reinhardt? Okay, I see him doing real estate on his Instagram, but he needs to be in L.A. I'm a Magic Heat fan, but – he needs okay. to be with LeBron, making plays, dribbling up the floor, point guard, shooting guard. And and I wrote this down, like, why don't you think there's enough or more players like you on, on squads, like a Tyler Hero? You know, the Heat are one of those squads that always have shooters. Bench, couple of shooters always on deck. Why don't more teams do that? I don't know. I think they just get super excited with, you know, guys that can jump out of the gym and have so mm-hmm. much athleticism and they have this and reality, when you look at somebody who can shoot pass, dribble and defend people would say, you know, uh, people would like my biggest knock was that I don't play defense. And I'm like, how? Like I, I bust my ass. I play great defense. If somebody makes a couple shots, they make a couple shots, but you can't say somebody's a lockdown defender and they do the same thing to that defender that they do to me. Yeah. And we're the same, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's no, I, I just, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but. Um, and that's probably the analytic bullshit. Five foot five dudes that's never even touched the backboard. Just looking at your size or whatever. And uh, huh, huh. Okay. Reinhardt's a tall guard. He can guard big guys, short guys. He's a shooter. In my opinion, if you're a shooter, you don't have to get up and lock somebody up. You know, distance enough to cause problems for people. I never understood yeah. that. Why us shooters, white guys, are bad defenders until we're locking somebody up like Pat Beverly. Not everyone needs to do yeah. that. Well, they look at it. I mean, you know, just to be super blunt, but they look at a white guy playing basketball like, nah, he's either a shooter or he's slow. He's this, can't jump out of the gym. Like, just because you don't guard 90 feet. Right. You know, it doesn't, doesn't mean – you can't guard the ball. You can't guard a pick and roll. You can't guard help side. I mean, how many players are out there right now on the floor? Does Tyler Harrell play defense? Absolutely that's his, not. That's his one thing they all say, huh? Can't play Absolutely defense. Not. He's a mismatch. But but he's he's up for six man of the year. Yep. And he's and he's a, and he's you know could be an all star. Right. And I mean, look, guys like Grayson Allen that everyone praises, he has good defense. He's a little reckless. I like Grayson a little bit as a fan, but he's a little reckless. So do you want a three-foul, four-foul game guy rather than somebody who's a little bit more safe? You know, I don't know. It's 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 such a a, a balance with the great defenders, in my opinion. Just yeah. make them make a tough shot. If, if I doubt. I used to tell my coach, I'm a small guy, if they score four times, three times in a row, get my ass out the game. Until yeah, then, yeah. let me get them. You yeah, know? and you don't have – I mean, you got guys that are that – are, that are built to do that. You got a guy like a Patrick Beverly. Put him on. Let him. Do, that's his. He can't shoot, pass, and dribble. Right. I mean, he can, but he can't. I'm making right. him make tough twos every time Rebels. down the floor. But he can. He can. He can guard. He makes the right play. So that's that's his. That's what he does. So are you going to put him? Are you going to let him shoot jumpers? Or are you going to tell him they can't shoot jumpers? Like I don't know. There's there's. There's a lot of like Tyler Hero. I love Tyler Hero's game, bro. 
Yeah, I love his game. I think it's great. I think yep. he, I think they need more people that can that can play multiple positions, make different plays. You know, being out there on the floor because you got you got one guy out there, you got four other people who can guard. Yeah, it just doesn't make sense. Like every team, besides the Heat, in my opinion, three, four, last four or five guys on that bench, it's like a big and maybe two little guards that might be able to bring the ball up the floor, and that's it. God forbid he has to yeah. make a layup. But the Heat, since the big three days, Battier, Mike Miller, J- uh, you know Jones, till this day, they always got those four shooters that sometimes Duncan Robinson, you don't even know who they are until they start popping off. And so I'm yeah. like, man, Lakers. Caden Reinhardt. We need this type of body, this type of shooter. Come on now. I mean, so, it would have, bro. I think hear you were going to go to the G all League. My to, all my buddies tell me that, though. They're like, dude, like, what? If you want the Lakers right now, they'd be. I was like, they were like, you you think uh, if you were playing for the Lakers, you would just sit in the corner and shoot threes if that's all they told you to do? I was like, what? Yeah. But I'm here. Do I need to? Because if you put me on the floor, I could pump fake, take one dribble down, dump it dump it for a back door. Like there's so many things that I could do on that floor that, you know, LeBron give me the rock on one Come time, on now. play pick and roll. Somebody switches and just drops back. Bow. There's a three. Yeah. Switch on LeBron, give him the ball. You know, like all these other things that you could do and play, and, you know, you could put me at the two guard spot there and you got a six foot, you know, you got a six foot five, two guard. Right. They got the Reeves kid there, which uh, you look cool, but I mean, okay. You, if you have a legit shooter with LeBron James that can dribble, most of the Heat guys weren't dribbling the ball, Caden Reinhardt. You were fucking out here doing crazy. This You're not putting Reeves to me. in a pick and roll and giving him the ball right. and letting him take care of the ball. It's not happening. Yeah, no way. So now, as you mentioned, we jumped into the real estate game. Now let's just keep it real. I, I got a couple of friends that are in the real estate, and you can tell some hit it big, some are a little grinding, some are different situations. How cutthroat, how real is real estate? I don't want to just hear it's nice. What's the parts that people no, don't realize? What's the hardships of real estate? Bro, it's 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 real. It's it's uh and and the thing is too is you know, people don't understand after playing basketball, being at a high level, you know, the the Guys that just get done playing ball, whether it's 21, 22, or 35, 36, or 28, whatever it is, you you go to the real world and you got to make money. That is what it is. And if you like driving cars, if you like one, you know, you want jewelry, you want this, like you got to make money to get it. So how are you going to go do that? And and realist, bro, I had five deals this year that all fell out and ended up just being nothing. That I was Damn. like, oh, I'm counting one, two, three, four. Okay, this is how much money I'm going to get. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was Banking doing in the it, beginning right. because it was, oh, I got this deal. Okay, cool. I'm put it this, you know, this is this is the money I'm making. And so it's very cutthroat. It's very, you got people that are just, you know, trying to go behind your back to get somebody, get a client to do business with and this and that. And it's it's definitely, you know, one of those things where you're hooping, you get paid every month, you know, this is in your account. Every month, you're getting this amount of money, um, which, you know, I would say, whether it's thirty million or five million or one hundred and fifty grand, whatever you sign for, you're capped. That's it. That's it. Yep. That's that's all the money you can make. Which those guys that make ninety million dollars, that's big money. Let's say you make two million bucks. That's your cap. You know, and and being an entrepreneur and being in real estate, there's no ceiling. There's no, I could go make $10 million or I could go make 30 grand. Um, So it's very, very cutthroat. And what I, what I did with, with real estate is I started a sports and entertainment division uh, within my company. And my company is a big multi-billion dollar company, uh, Nest Seekers International, big, big company. And uh, got a lot of people playing in the league, uh, whether it's football, basketball, baseball. And, And what I did was not being involved with, the coaching side, training side, agent side. Now I'm on a side where I'm an agent as, you know, a real estate agent, but um, <clears throat> I'm going to help these guys. Let's say you got $5 million in the portfolio. You want to invest your money in and we'll go make it. We'll go turn that five into 10. Um, or let's say you get traded from the Lakers to New York and you got to sell your LA home and go find a house in New York. We're going to help sell your house in, in LA. Mm. We're going to help we're going to go find you a house in New York. We got all this stuff that's not even hitting the market. We got like all these different types of things where now you're relating to somebody who played at the highest level, who played, you know, played basketball and you relate 
a little bit differently than, you know, a 60 year old guy with a suit on. Right. Um, no offense. And a lot of those people that do tons of business are great and they are reputable and people use them. I'm just talking about the average, like, Oh, Hey, we got LeBron. He's over here and he's got to find a house. Mm-hmm. Can you find him a house? Yeah. I think he just goes on the internet. Like, no, we got a portfolio ready to send you as soon as you know, you're oh. going to Atlanta, as soon as you're going to Florida, as soon as you're going, whatever it is and go ahead and pick it out this is the house you want. Cool. We got these homeowners, you know, contacts. And so that was cool to start, you know, that way I can be involved with, uh, with athletes and, you know, uh, celebrities and whatever that might be and still be in that realm, uh, right. w- without being, you know, fully as a engaged. hooper. Yeah. On the, on the, on that side. That's dope, man. Now, High school Caden was no sleeve, no tats. Now we see Caden right hard, big boy tattoos. Everything looks fire. Do you have one tattoo artist? You got a few of them. Is it uh you gotta be a special somebody to put the ink on the body? What's that like? Yeah, bro. So I got uh I got my sleeve done in college. Uh I got I got my sleeve done in college by this guy. Uh super cool. I had no money in college. Like I was like, where's the cheapest tattoo guy? You know, yeah. Like, <laughs> where where can I go get tatted that's good work without being like, okay, I'm going to put something on my arm. My mom's going to be like, what in the hell did you do? Right. So uh, I found a dude that was super cool. And, uh, you know, he did my he did my tattoos really, really well. And uh, after college, I met another guy who is going to do my second sleeve, which is – he's crazy, bro. He's so good. He's the homie down here. Anybody goes down to – west coast or la long beach his instagram's ink crazy great tattoo artist bro great tattoo artist yeah i got a few of them myself i only let one guy do it because i'm like you did such a great work that anybody else would just be disrespect i can't do that to you or my body so i'm sticking with one guy yeah i I can't i want to say that but this guy's this new guy's way he's just you know he's up he's good he's he was on ink masters uh and then ended up uh getting off and he wanted to start his own company and so he started his own you know his his own uh his own company and business and now he's just rolling and he's and he's great now kate i don't want to take it take too much of your time dog i appreciate you jumping on this show as a family man a married man a father i want to ask what does family mean to you and not even so much of your immediate family, but also your family going up. Because you got three brothers. You guys have always looked close. You know what I'm saying? We followed that. What's that like? And then what's your family moving down that you've now created? What's family mean to Caden Reinhardt? Yeah. Um, I would say family means everything to me, bro. It's, you know, the more and more I've gotten through life and getting older and more experience in different scenarios, I feel like, <clears throat> you know, everybody's got different family lives and everyone's got different relationships with their family. Um, but I can't say that everyone's got one, at least one family member that's always going to tell them, you know, what they don't want to hear in a good way, positive criticism. They're always going to be, you know, your biggest fan, your biggest advocate. Somebody's always going to push you to be the best you can be. And they're always going to be there for you too. They're not going to be, you know, somebody that you can meet and all of a sudden burn bridges and then they're just gone two years, you know, down the line. Like these are, you know, my family, my brothers are my, are my best friends. They're all in my, they were my, three of them were in my wedding as my best man, all three of them. So those are, you know, those are, those are my guys though. I, I hang out with them and two other people and, you know, they're, they're my best friends now. And so, you know, my pops, now that I'm a little bit older and now he's, you know, he's still young. Right. Um, we've grown that friend relationship as, as opposed to father, son, still my pops, but, you know, now we have that connection, which is really cool. So I'd say, you know, having that family life, you know, meant everything to me growing up, put me in the right, you know, positions to succeed and, you know, helped me throughout life. And then, you know, now, bro, being married, I have the best wife, you know, she's beautiful. She's awesome. Uh, I have my son who's just fantastic. I just, you know, I can't wait till he hoops one day. Yeah. Start doing that. It'd be, be cool to get in the gym with them and start working out and doing things. That'll be surreal for me, but um it's everything bro for sure and when you had your son did life slow down or did it speed up for you or a little bit of both i'd say i'd say the last like five years it's it's just flown by bro. i feel like everything like once you get i I had this conversation with somebody the other day i'm like once you hit 22 23 it just flies 
like all of a sudden you're like uh sunday i'll be 29 my birthday's on sunday i turn 29 that's right and no, uh, 21st congrats yeah i'm like dang bro like this is i just remember getting out of college you know and it just mm-hmm. it just goes by so um you know him he uh he'll be 10 months in a couple of days and just you know that that 10 months felt like it just went by i feel like I, he was just born so definitely speeding up for sure yeah and now i got two more for you before i let you go as a married man i'm single okay i got a few girls i've had in my time a couple <laughs> broke my heart a couple whatever as a married man you've had your girl for a while i've uh seen that on your instagram shout out to you guys beautiful what uh love mean to Kane and Reinhardt? That's a deep question, bro. I got to know, brother. I'm looking for it. So I got to know what to look <laughs> for, what not to, you know a, what I'm saying? That's a deep, that's a deep question. I didn't, I wasn't prepared for that one. <laughs> uh, man, I would just say somebody that just, that supports you in, in, you know, any, any type of way, you know, when you have somebody that loves you, they, they, they support everything that you do, no matter what it is. And they're always going to push you to be better. They're always going to, you know, as, as much as you don't want to hear it, they're always going to tell you that you're doing something wrong when you're doing something wrong. Um, it's like having a, it's like having a, you know, an accountability partner times 10, you know, somebody that's just going to, the, the reason they're, they're keeping you accountable is to, to make you better as a person and, and better as, you know, an individual and what, whatever you're doing and whatever career you're doing. Um, you know, if, if this is something that you're pursuing and you want to do this at a high level, you know, having that person next to you that can push you to keep doing that and keep succeeding. And then, you know, by, by doing that, they're just showing that, you know, they care about you. They love you. They want you, they want the best for, for you and out of you. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's something that, you know, I was like, "Ah, I don't know when I'm going to get married. I don't know when I'm going to find a girl to settle down with. And then you find, you find somebody that checks all those boxes yeah. you know that you want to be checked and you're like okay this is this is it that's beautiful well now i'll know a little bit more to look for okay dog i just like i said <laughs> yeah. i've been trying to duck and dodge and weave but all my boys that are married in love i'll be asking them hey what's it mean brother give me the keys give me the secret code yeah. so i'm trying to get it i appreciate you kate and the last one i want to get off before i let you go I re like I said, I rewatched a lot of the videos today and I did notice on one of the high school follow along videos, you said you like to make music. Are we still making music? Is that rapping? Is that producing? Because hey, yeah. hey, Big Wado, I got some songs. So what are we talking about, K? <laughs> yeah, bro. So funny story. Uh, uh, when I was 16, me and my brothers, we all uh, we all got a microphone. We were just messing around on GarageBand and it became something that like for me hoops and, and music just you know went went hand in hand and i'm and i like all types of music like yes i just love music so it doesn't matter if you like well i don't listen to country music all the time i don't listen gotcha. but gotcha. like if you make a song like i appreciate the art in the song what goes into it how they made the beat how they made you know all these types of things so uh <clears throat> it, it got to the point where my younger brother is a musician right now he makes right, music big time. yeah big yeah he's, he's 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 doing it bro it's tough tough business but you know he's he's grinding he makes music and he's great at what he does um so we we all like me and my brothers every time we get in the car we put a beat on freestyle yes, you know man. we'll be like oh let's go to the studio let's go to the studio we'll go to the studio and just like my brother will make a beat mix it up send it to us like all right we're gonna get in on thursday and just go at it and we'll just sit there for hours bro just yep. trying to make yep. a, you know a banger but we got some <laughs> we got some stuff that that uh, if we if we released would be like everybody i've showed they're like yo this is cold like this is see then they hey, find out now, it was if me, anybody like, didn't no, know <laughs> hey okay and got some bars and hey my boy Kane Reinhardt's thinking about joining and making a podcast so might have some intro music for us that no one knows who it will be and let us it's you, dog. So that's might have to might have to unreveal <laughs> it during your show. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, we got to. We got to. It'd be it'd be fun. We gotta have you. If I do a podcast, we gotta have you on a podcast. We'll do that. Oh, for I'll sure. definitely pull up. You know I me. Mean? Yeah. If you ever need any info, help on it, you can reach out, man. I'll help you out. It's fucking easy as Kate. You just gotta be the man, and you already got that checked mm-hmm. off, brother. So all you need is Appreciate a mic and it, a little man. screen. But Kate, I don't yeah. want to take too much of your time, legend out there in Cali time. 
I appreciate you coming on. Any last words for the people? I know I had to let you come on just because I know, just like me, there's some people out there wondering where our boy Caden Reinhardt has been. Any yeah, last no, words, I, my brother? I appreciate it, bro. Thanks for having me on here. It's uh, it's uh, it's good to you know kind of share a story that nobody's really heard throughout you know college professional and now where I'm at in life I haven't really posted anything said oh, I'm done playing or retired or you know so it's nice to get on here and talk and kind of let everybody know you know where I'm at but I would just say you know it's just keep grinding you know whoever's out there just whatever you're doing out there just keep grinding at whatever you do and be and be a dog in anything that you do and you know give it 100 percent just try to go after it you know, full head of steam. And if you fail, you fail, get right back up and do the same thing over again. Boom. That's it. Dog mentality. He embodies it. We'll try to be just like him. Kate and Reinhardt, man. I appreciate you so much, so much for dropping in on this yep. Waddle podcast, episode 19. The man, the myth, the legend. Kate and Reinhardt. Appreciate you, dog. Yep. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it. What a legend. What an icon. Like I said, man, that's one of my childhood heroes. That's a dream come true for me. So anybody that's watching live, I appreciate you tuning in. Anybody that's going to tune, tune in moving forward, I appreciate you. Look at me. I can't even talk right now, bro. I just had a fucking superstar in my studio, bro. Kaden Reinhardt. Tighten up. Whew. As you know, man, it's your boy YDOE. And this episode will be live on YouTube as we go right now. And I will also upload the audio uh, version to the audio platforms. And uh, I listen, I know y'all know what's coming, baby. I hope you're having a great day, okay? A great week, a great month, and most importantly, a great life. And it's up to you, okay? It's all perspective. Right now, it's, it, it's pouring rain outside of my goddamn house. I thought I was going to lose power the whole show. Didn't. We prevailed. I'm having a great day, baby. It's blessed. We doing it. Let's keep on going. And I'm going to wrap this show up, man. I appreciate anybody tuning in. And, uh, you know, as as we always say. And Adam, they're here. Thank you, Wado. Thank you, Wado. You're welcome. And Adam. Boy, you already know how it's going on. I might change my name. Wado. Wado. I think so. That's what he said. W-H-U-D-O. Wado. Wado. I just always got to love playing that. Shout out to Pat and the boys. Shout out to Coach JB coming back live next week with the relaunch of his show, The Real Coach JB Show. I got me my slap dick whiskey, as you know. So besides that, we're going to wrap up this nice episode 19 of the Wido Podcast on this Thursday, August 18th, 2022. I hope everybody has a great night. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm watching as they leave. Who knows what's going on? I'm going to end it, rewatch it, see where I could have improved, see where I can uh, improve moving forward. If you want somebody, if you want to come on the show for an interview, hit me on the DM. Shoot me a message on Instagram, at Wido. Follow your boy. Like, subscribe to the channel if you like it. Besides that, we're going to get out of here. I hope everybody has a great night. Until next time, it's your boy, Y-D-O-E. Whew.